In Jane Austen's novel Pride and Prejudice, the author's heroine Elizabeth is invited to survey the grounds at Pemberley, the estate of her acquaintance and soon-to-be suitor Mr. Darcy. The grounds are enormous, intricate, and luxurious. She remarks to herself, to be a mistress of Pemberley might be something. Imagining all of the delights, dignities, and honors which would be easily afforded to the owner of such a grand English manor. Being no social or political historian, Elizabeth is awestruck by the status and magnificence of Pemberley, but gives no consideration to the efficient system of highly specialized servants which must create and maintain these grounds. To use the language of the classic Edwardian British comedy, both Austen and her character Elizabeth are clearly from upstairs. Little attention is paid to downstairs. But in the downstairs, there is a specialized, almost mechanistic system of servants, butlers, groomsmen, guards, and maids. This team of specialists, tradesmen, all highly precise and restricted in their duties and tasks, were assigned into a very rigid hierarchy. For instance, the chef uh, could cook, but had no control over wine. The butler could decant wine, but had none of the properties or responsibilities of a still room maid. Furthermore, these roles were all arranged into hierarchy. The housekeeper was in charge of all of the female servants in the house, except for the ladies' maids, who were under the servitude of the lady of the house directly. The steward, but never the butler, could give orders to the chef. The chef could prepare food, but was deemed incapable of selecting wine or presentation. This alone was the task of the butler. Footmen were not supposed to do a valet's work, and vice versa. All of the tasks were arranged by tradition, highly organized, and technically specialized. What is truly impressive about this system is its invisibility. The hierarchies, the chain of command, the specialized tasks of gardeners and chambermaids made life appear seamless to the folks of the upstairs. Food appears magically at the, t the appointed time, beds are made, Gardening is done all in complete ignorance of the denizens of the lords and ladies of the house. This illustration, first given by the anthropologist Pascal Boyer, is a vivid example of the amount of disconnection between appearance and reality. I think it makes a perfect analogy into some of the fundamental features of the mind, and in the course of my next videos, I will be drawing back on this example to demonstrate how your mind works. There are three basic lessons that we can draw from this analogy. Number one, you are a guest in your own mind. The first realization is that you and all of your experiences, thoughts, memories, fears, sounds, tastes, and desires are all taking place at the guest's view of the mind. Your brain and your mind work in often bizarre and strange ways, and in order to understand the way your mind works, you must first abandon the idea that you know what is going on in your own house and in your own head. Your conscious realization takes the Elizabeth view of the world and is often completely ignorant of the workings which take place to present the world and your thoughts in the way you perceive them. Through the course of learning about the brain and cognition, you will see that the inner workings which take place outside of the range of your own awareness are vast and intricate indeed. For instance, you will soon learn that there are enormous gaps in your knowledge that most of your memories are likely false or at least exaggerated, and even in looking at this very screen, there's a section of the upper left-hand side of your visual field which is completely blind. You've never seen this before because your obedient groups of servants that make up your brain close the curtains on your embarrassing deficiency and make you think that you can see perfectly well. This can be seen in the following demonstration given by user Quirkology which shows the blind spot and the vanishing head illusion. We're going to perform the amazing vanishing head illusion in less than a minute. Here we go. You need to sit back from the monitor and cover up or close your right eye. Now with your left eye, stare at the cross next to me. Now keep on looking at the cross and slowly move towards the monitor. And at some point, my head will appear to disappear. When that happens, stay exactly where you are. It's an incredible illusion. You'll still see my body, you'll still see my hands moving, but my head just won't be there. What's even more remarkable is as I move this up, you'll see a continuous black bar where my head should be. It's a great illusion and just goes to show what you can achieve in less than a minute.
Number two, your mind is a group of specialists. Your mind is not an all-purpose learning and reasoning machine. It is not, as John Locke once described, a tablet of wax upon which the world impresses itself. Nor is it a type of catch-all handyman figure who is equipped to handle all, all jobs and tasks equally. No, you inhabit a society of mind made up of small, specialized workers who break up hard processing problems into small, manageable tasks. Much more like a factory assembly line than an all-purpose handyman. This fact usually only becomes obvious to us when, we, when one of the workers fails to perform their specialized tasks. A striking example of this in the brain is a pathology known as unilateral neglect. This is a patient, Peggy. She has suffered a stroke on the right side of her brain, specifically in the cortex of her parietal lobe. This area is devoted to specialists which integrate the sensations of the skin, muscles, and limbs to form a coherent picture of the world. Damage to this area of the cortex distorts our perception in strange and often frightening ways. When this happened to Peggy, half of her world appeared to simply vanish from consciousness. Sure. Let's go. This time, Peggy, I'm going to show you this picture of a cat, right. and I'd like you to draw it as accurately as you can. Right, okay. Neglect is very little, if anything, to do with your eyes. The vast majority of the problem arises from the brain processes involved in attention. and that your attentional system provides for where your eyes move. So in other words, if something happens in my visual field that's interesting, I'll move my eyes there. But why would you move your eyes there? Only if your attentional system indicated you needed to move there. So your eyes, eyes are slaves to your attentional system. And what's wrong in neglect is the attentional system has been damaged. You notice that this cat has got two tails. No, I didn't notice that. Mm, so you don't have it on that side, do you? No. Is there anything else missing in it? Um, you, for instance, look around the, the left-hand side. Is there yeah. anything? That looks missing. Uh, that, yes, that, that shoulder's missing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yes. Mm. The other part of the body is, isn't mm. it? I don't think about it, you see. So you thought you'd drawn a complete cat mm. with all the details? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. When I show this to you now, and mm. you're seeing this again, does this surprise you? I was very surprised to see that other tail. Very right. surprised, yeah. And what do you think when you see... Because I really didn't see that at all. And what do you think when you see something like this now, when I draw attention to it? I don't know how I could have missed it. Hmm. I don't know how I could have missed it. I really don't. It would be inaccurate to say that Peggy's disorder is visual. She can see the entire cat. Nor is this unilateral neglect limited to vision alone. These patients often find themselves only dressing one side of their bodies or failing to even remember the left half of familiar objects and landmarks. This is not a symptom of insanity. It's merely when one of our servants fails to show up for work, another servant fills in the role by making it appear to us as if the drawing is complete. Number three, your mind is inherited. Why are the jobs of the butlers and maids so completely different? Why is there a strict distinction between the work of a valet and the work of a groomsman? Without going into the detailed history, the simple answer is that these roles are rigidly defined by tradition. Their roles and boundaries are passed down through history from predecessors. This is not a different idea from the central claims of evolution. Your fingers are evolved mechanisms with a specialized set of functions and a complete evolutionary history. So is your brain, and so is your mind. All of these have adapted functions and evolutionary histories with, which stretch back through the history of life itself. A stunning example of this is the performance of apes in self-recognition tasks, where they often outperform even young children on this important test of self-assessment and awareness. It's important to emphasize that this evolutionary explanation stands true not only for the higher executive level functions like self-perception, but also for even the most basic and me mechanistic levels, such as the 
processing of high and low frequency information in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus, where the very anatomical organization of your visual system only makes sense in light of evolution. The inner magnocellular layer is responsible for processing information vital to survival, and the outer parvocellular layer evolved later, allowing for processing of high resolution and color imagery. With those basic rules properly understood, we can now begin to explore the world of the mind in all its richness, perplexity, and terror.